To paraphrase noted scientist Dr. Heinz Doofenshmirtz, If I had a nickel for every time there was a safe class anomaly that manifests an absurdly long entity that's stuck on the ground and pops up at multiple points around the world, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice. Incidentally, that happens to be the case with SCP-1193, the buried giant, and SCP-2952, Corgi. They're a pair of mysterious creatures with very thought-provoking similarities between them. But while both are exceedingly long entities, neither are particularly long stories. So today, we're giving you a rare SCP-explained anomaly double feature. Let's begin with the first of our two very long boys, SCP-1193. The exact nature of SCP-1193's anomalous qualities are challenging to define. It appears to have biological, spatial, and even temporal elements. SCP-1193-01, the primary component of SCP-1193, is a human arm that appears completely normal in a genetic sense, but exhibits a freakish length and bone structure. This absurdly long arm was first discovered in a drainage pipe inside the basement of a telephone switching station in Scottsdale, Arizona where it had somehow become trapped. How this anomaly was first discovered, or by whom, is not recorded. Approximately 10 centimeters below the drainage gate of the pipe, the arm terminates in what seems to be a human hand of indeterminate gender that is unremarkable in both size and structure. Upon initial examination, the Foundation believed that the arm somehow threaded through 35 meters of drainage pipe. But the use of an endoscopic camera within the pipe revealed that the reality is much more severe. The arm extends to at least 71 kilometers beneath the Earth, which is around double the overall length of Scottsdale, Arizona itself, with elbows regularly spaced across every 4 kilometers of arm. Elbows below a depth of 26 kilometers are slightly retroflexed to accommodate a 9 degrees southward bend in the drainage borehole. Interestingly, the arm was also somehow able to pass through the Mohorovich discontinuity, which is the lower limit of the Earth's crust and the volcanic hot upper mantle. The arm could actually be longer than what we're currently aware, but the Foundation doesn't have any technology hardy enough to follow the arm all the way down into the Earth. Conversations that Foundation staff have had with what is believed to be SCP-1193-01 via the use of SCP-1193-02 indicates that the entity may have no thermoreception. It has described itself as being stuck in environments that, contextually, should have either extremely high or extremely low temperatures. This does not seem to register with SCP-1193-01. This may serve as an explanation as to why it is experiencing no discomfort, despite the borehole temperatures having been measured in excess of 674 degrees centigrade. But what exactly is SCP-1193-02? SCP-1193-02 is a GPO-746 rotary telephone with a topaz yellow plastic exterior manufactured in 1971. Because of the physical dimensions of the phone, it is too large to have been delivered from below via the borehole, so we know that SCP-1193-01 didn't put it there. The working theory of Foundation researchers assigned to the 1193 case is that the phone was installed here specifically to facilitate communications with the trapped SCP-1193-01. It is attached to a conventional twisted pair line, which enters the drainage pipe containing SCP-1193-01 and descends parallel to SCP-1193-01 until endoscopy is no longer practical. Who or what installed the phone? How? And to what end beyond just chatting with the entity? The Foundation doesn't presently know, and the investigation is ongoing. One clue to the purpose of SCP-1193-02 is the fact that its rotary dial has been permanently glued in place, rendering it unusable for any kind of outgoing calls. Instead, the phone only receives calls, and the only calls it seems to receive are from a being that seems to be SCP-1193-01. Every weekday between 8.32 a.m. and 10.34 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, the phone will ring up to five times. When answered by a member of Foundation personnel, an unidentified voice believed to be that of SCP-1193-01 will willingly engage in conversation with the person on the other end of the line. The Foundation has used this opportunity to question SCP-1193-01 about its own nature, but it's impossible to really know how reliable the entity's answers are. The voice on the line always refers to itself as a human being, and often mistakes the Foundation personnel for authority figures such as doctors, firemen, or police. 
As a result of this, The Voice has been forthcoming with information, and the interviews have been relatively straightforward. There have been notable similarities between the information that The Voice voluntarily gives about itself and the known facts about the condition of SCP-1193-01, lending credibility to the idea that they are one and the same. The Foundation fastidiously records conversations with The Voice and has created a list of anomalous details the entity has surrendered during the phone calls. These include having human features, but an anomalous body plan. So The Voice seems to have all the right pieces for a human being but in a bizarre configuration. This may explain the extremely long, many-jointed arm. Whatever species or subspecies this entity is, it may not be alone, as the voice often refers to a cousin or some kind of other relative who's on the way to pick it up. The voice often talks about its feelings of discomfort or boredom at its state of being confined. It also makes reference to strange seismic activity along the Little Chino Fault Complex an upper branch of the Elsinore Fault Zone of Southern California, over 300 miles away from Arizona. This may be because the source of the voice is so far underground, it's still able to feel the tremors resonating upwards. But one of the most frequent trends of all in these conversations is that the voice venting frustration that its arm, or some other body part, is stuck in an inconvenient place. This list of places has been exhaustive, but includes handcuffs, a jelly jar, a pipe, a cast, or in one instance, a gopher hole. Naturally, this has been seen as a cause for concern among Foundation staff. If SCP-1193 does have spatially anomalous components, is it possible that someone could find a 70-kilometer arm sticking out of a gopher hole or a jelly jar sometime soon? Only time will tell. The Foundation currently regards any information about the physical form of the entity beyond the exposed section of the arm reached via endoscopy as provisional. In other words, they really have no idea what they're dealing with here, and are unlikely to find out for sure anytime soon. Two phone conversations with the voice via SCP-1193-02 have been transcribed in the addendum to 1193's main file. Both are conversations between The Voice and Dr. Hassan Iqbal, director of research at the local SCP containment site. In the first of two conversations, recorded on March 24, 2008, Dr. Iqbal asked who was calling, and The Voice identified itself as David. The Voice, or David, appeared to be in its usual state of frustration and distress. Incorrectly believing that Dr. Iqbal was a medical doctor at the hospital he was currently trapped inside, David implored him to remove the cast from his bottom arm. When Dr. Iqbal questioned David on what exactly a bottom arm is, he responded with confusion. When Dr. Iqbal told him that he was a research scientist, not a medical doctor, David became frustrated, implied that Dr. Iqbal was incompetent, and hung up. The next recorded call between Dr. Iqbal and The Voice occurred exactly a year later. In this call, The Voice incorrectly believed that Dr. Iqbal was a fireman. The Voice complained about having reached into its oven to pull out some cakes, becoming stuck in the process. He pleaded for help, saying that the oven was a tight fit. When Dr. Iqbal showed concern about the potentially high temperatures within the oven, The Voice didn't seem to know what he meant. In the end, The Voice became frustrated and resolved to instead call its cousin. It apologized and hung up. Most calls appear to follow this general structure. Because of the static and incredibly subdued nature of the anomaly, the Foundation has deemed that SCP-1193 poses no meaningful risk of containment breach. As a result, it has been given the rare, safe classification. In order to keep it properly contained, the drainage borehole containing SCP-1193-01 is capped with a tungsten steel grate containing a locking 2.5cm endoscopy aperture, meaning a small hole through which to feed the endoscopic camera. Every 48 hours, the drainage borehole is inspected with an endoscope for any further developments concerning the anomalous arm. Seismographic monitoring devices are posted at 2, 7, and 11 kilometer depths alongside the SCP-1193-01 borehole. Seismic readings consistent with a subterranean movement are reported immediately to Site Director Iqbal. In the event of what is referred to as subterranean containment breach, Researchers and guards working around 1193 are ordered to perform Protocol 473A. This involves severing SCP-1193 below the fifth elbow and backfilling remaining portions of the borehole with pressurized concrete to seal the hole forever. The SCP-1193-02 phone is monitored at all times by a trained Foundation interrogator 
and standard procedure dictates that SCP-1193-02 is to be answered on or before the third ring. During these calls, the interrogator will attempt to elicit valuable information about SCP-1193 from the voice, and all valuable intel will then be recorded and logged. The Buried Giant is one of the more perplexing safe class anomalies handled by the SCP Foundation. So much about its true nature is unknown to this day. But a concern that both we and the Foundation share is not knowing where the entity's other limbs are currently residing. For all we know, they could be sticking out of an oven, a gopher hole, or even a jelly jar somewhere near you. Weird, right? Well, if you think that's strange, let us now introduce you to SCP-2952, or Corgi. Trust us, if you're not familiar with this one already, you are not ready for the strange turns this is about to take. In the simplest terms, Corgi is a cheerful Welsh Pembroke Corgi with an adorable face and a thick, shiny coat. He's also over 30,000 kilometers in length, with his head and front legs sticking out of the ground in Portland, Oregon, and his hindquarters being all the way over in a rural area of Japan's Karawa District. His body weaves all across the globe with sections of it surfacing all over the Americas, Europe, and much of Asia. Studies to find African or Australian sections of SCP-2952 are still ongoing. Despite his massive length, there seems to be no delay in reaction times either. You pat his head in the USA and his tail will immediately start wagging over in Japan. He's honestly just precious. He also doesn't appear to need food or water, and thanks to the somewhat sadistic experiments of one researcher, Mills, we know that he can quickly regenerate from all damage done to him, too. Okay, now you're familiar with this very good, albeit very long lad. It's time for things to get really, really strange. You see, on the different exposed section of SCP-2952's body, there are tiny openings designated SCP-2952-1. Stay with us here. There are 324 openings all over the world, some in major cities, others in suburban areas, some in the tiniest and most rural of hamlets. At this point, you probably have the very reasonable question, why are there over 300 openings in this dog? Well, we're going to answer that, but we can't promise it won't just give you more confusing questions. When the openings appear, humanoid beings designated SCP-2952-2 will begin to exit the corgi. For the sake of clarity, we'll refer to these little creatures as the Welsh Fair Folk, or the Fae, though there are many different subgroups of Fae. And we really do mean little in this case. On average, they're a puny 3 centimeters tall, and they're also invisible to the naked eye, with indirect methods like photographs or videos being the only way to view them. Though they do leave evidence of their presence beyond their direct physical appearances, like shadows or footprints. Corgi acts as a kind of transport system for these little people. Openings on the dexterous side of SCP-2952 take passengers west, while those on the sinistrous side take passengers east. Passengers can be seen entering and exiting at regular intervals. The Foundation has even been able to track a group of passengers getting on the Corgi transit system and getting off at a later stop. From this, the Foundation has been able to estimate that the speed of the system is 120 kilometers per hour, excluding stops to let passengers on and off along the way, which, for the record, is a pretty leisurely pace by train standards. Naturally, the SCP Foundation weren't exactly thrilled to learn about an anomalous transit system that worked to spread further anomalies all over the world. In fact, that's kind of a nightmare scenario for them. So, they marshaled their global forces, located each of the openings along the torso of the Corgi system, and blocked them up. At this point, the SCP Foundation were ready to give themselves a pat on the back, close up shop for the night, and go out for after-work drinks. However, there was one thing that they'd all forgotten. Hell hath no fury like a society of Welsh Fae who've just had their daily commute ruined. The Council of Tywith Teg, the ruling body, doesn't take kindly to having their public services messed with and the manner of their retaliation was less like a group of disgruntled, anomalous civil servants, and more like a kind of fey mafia. They would make the Foundation rue the day they messed with Corgi, with a series of retaliatory strikes that group of interest like Chaos Insurgency and the Children of the Scarlet King could only dream of. It began with the kidnapping of Project Director Stevens, who'd authorized the containment project. He vanished from his apartment and was replaced with an adult European mole which seems to be the fey equivalent of leaving a horse's head in the bed as an offer you can't refuse to send a message. But it didn't stop there. 
Over the next three weeks, 17 different members of personnel, specifically construction workers, who'd worked on the project woke up to find that the walls of their houses had been entirely replaced by poison ivy and death cap mushrooms. And after two months, researcher Mills, the weird dog torturer we told you about earlier, woke up with a highly poisonous nightshade berries in his mouth and hawthorn stakes driven through his hands and feet, crucifixion style all perpetrated by some very upset three-inch transport workers. At this point, the Foundation put together who was behind these attacks and decided to try to make amends with the Fae whom they'd understandably upset with their treatment of Corgi. A plan was drafted to have all the SCP-2952-1 entrances unburied. After this undertaking was completed, the Fey retribution came to an end, and most of the damage was undone. Director Stevens was returned unharmed. The construction workers got their walls back. And, well, researcher Mills didn't get better, but I think we can all agree that animal cruelty isn't really a crime that we should be forgiving lightly. After all this chaos had transpired and the SCP Foundation had fully made amends, Director Stevens had a note left on his desk by a starling, which then flew off before it could be caught. By the way, can we just take a second to appreciate that the SCP Foundation has contained literal demigods and interdimensional horrors, but Director Stevens was outfoxed by a bird? Wonderful, those Fey truly are built different. Anyway, the note on his desk translated from Welsh read, Thank you for your prompt response to commuter complaints and wonderful customer service. As such, we have granted all members of your organization complimentary transportation on our Corgi system. Please send a sparrow to the Council of the City Office nearest you if you have further questions. G. Foxglove, Director of Transportation, the Council of the Tylwyth Teg. And with tremendous relief that the slate had finally been cleared, the Foundation decided that they would accept the kind offer extended to them by the Council and send one of their field agents to take a look inside the Corgi system. The field agent in question was Agent Elizabeth Davies, chosen for her pleasant social skill and proficiency in Welsh. With the intention to take a ride in mind and connected to an audio and video feeds linked back to Central Command, Agent Davies touched the side of Corgi. This caused her to shrink down to a height of 3.2 centimeters, much like all the other commuters. She stepped into the SCP-2952 entrance and found that on the inside, it looked not unlike a regular train, though some carriages seemed to be in disrepair and everything was written in Welsh. Oh, and everything was made with wood and plant matter, too. The chassis appeared to be constructed from birch, and all the seat cushions were made of flower petals. It was all very whimsical, honestly. Agent Davies struck up conversations with some of the other commuters. One complained about delays caused by the fact that Corgi was suffering from kidney stones a problem that the Foundation is eager to help the poor animal get over to keep the transit system running smoothly. She also chatted with a sweet elderly lady on the train who was getting people to sign a petition to allow mice back onto the Corgi transit system. When Agent Davies departed the system, she patted the dog and told him he was a good boy, before returning to normal size. Since January 5th, 2017, the Corgi system and its passengers have become invisible to everyone who wasn't officially under SCP Foundation employ. This has allowed it for its reclassification as a safe anomaly. So there you have it, folks. At least one of our two very long boys got everything sorted out. We love occasionally doing a happy ending here at SCP Explained. Remember to stay tuned for our next episode about the time that SCP-106 managed to get onto a school bus. What? We did say occasionally. Now go check out Why Everyone Wants to Eat This Corpse, SCP-1176, and SCP-2935 Oh Death and more epic SCP stories you can't miss for more bizarre anomalies that will blow your mind. So long, folks.